George Bernard Shaw once said of the death of Jesus Christ, we crucified him on a stick, but I have always had the curious feeling that he somehow managed to get a hold of the right end of it. This is something I would like to talk about today. How in Christ's crucifixion, what seems like such a sad, tragic loss of defeat, is actually God getting the upper hand on things, and how he seeks to offer this same upper hand to each of us. Over the last five weeks, we've watched Jesus uh, travel deeper and deeper into the darkness that will be his death. He began his time on the cross forgiving his executioners and reaching out to a repentant sinner. As the shadows began to gather, he said goodbye to his loved ones, And then in the height of his agony, he cried out the separation that is our sin and the pain of his physical body. It all seems to be coming to a horrible end, failed and hopeless and wrong. And Jesus' sixth word from the cross would appear to reinforce this. It is finished, he said. What does he mean by this? Does Does he mean that it's all over, done, failed? What does it mean that on the cross, he's finished? Well, for Pontius Pilate and the other Roman government officials, having Jesus finished, over and done with, was, of course, a great relief. It was trouble enough trying to rule this people. The last thing they needed was an uprising, a riot, with all the people in town for the religious holiday. Having Jesus finished was a relief. For them, finished meant avoidance, the avoidance of trouble. For Jesus' adversaries, the, the religious leaders, having Jesus finished was a necessity if they were to maintain their power and control. Jesus, you see, he was, he was offensive to them, and having all those people following him was a, was a great threat. They wanted to return, to people, the religious leaders wanted to return to business as usual, to God as usual, at least as they understood God and had defined him. God, get Jesus out of the way, let the people calm down and get back to normal. The crowds would forget him quickly enough once he was out of sight. For them, finished meant business as usual. Jesus' followers, of course, felt very differently. For them, finished meant the end of a dream. Their loss was more than just flesh and blood. With with Jesus' death went all their hopes of the triumphant arrival of the Messiah, now foiled. If he even was the Messiah, everything was wrecked and ruined and in doubt. The struggle lost. Darkness had won for them. Finished meant defeat, the ultimate defeat. So as Jesus says, it is finished, it seems he's speaking for many people at that moment. Many people proclaiming loss, finality, and closure. Yet ironically, in speaking for all of them, he ultimately speaks for none of them. Because for Jesus, finished doesn't mean avoidance, doesn't mean business as usual, and it does not mean defeat. That he has somehow lost, failed, or been beaten. No, quite the contrary. For Jesus, finished means victory. And this is the premise of my sermon this morning, that it is finished proclaims a great victory, the greatest possible victory, a victory Jesus seeks to offer to us. But how? What is finished in Christ's crucifixion that gives us the victory, that turns seemingly tragic loss into ultimate triumph? Three thoughts. First, what is finished is God's plan for the salvation of the world. Right off the top, you know, to say that something is finished implied, of course, that something preceded it, right? I mean, I know that sounds kind of obvious when I say it, but it's something so obvious that it's often overlooked, especially here. For something to now be finished... Something had to come before it, had to be leading up to it. And in announcing it is finished, the hearer is thus drawn to consider you know, what, it, what it is, to look back at what preceded this moment. In this way, the word finished here might also be translated as accomplished or, or completed. It denotes something seen to completion, most particularly a task or a responsibility fulfilled. And it invites the, the hearer to look at that. And I believe this is the, the first direction Jesus is seeking to, to point us towards here. Uh, to point us back toward what preceded this moment on the cross, to let us know that in saying it is finished, he is not simply announcing that his time on the cross is just about over, his, his life about to end. Rather, he's proclaiming the far deeper fact that in, in, in this time over, in his life ended, why he was here, the job he came to do, the task, the responsibility entrusted to him has been accomplished, has been completed. And, and this, you see, is crucial. You know, many people, often many people, right, even within the, within the church, they often tend to believe that Jesus' death on the cross was somehow a mistake, an accident, a sad wrong that somehow shouldn't have happened and wouldn't have happened if only things had just been a little bit different. You know, different people, different situation, different time. Well, let us be clear, you know. 
As we noted a few weeks ago, Jesus' death is the only thing, the only thing that heals the separation between us and God, that heals that sin, that ends that sin, the brokenness of creation. There is no other way. There is no substitute for this. If sin is going to be stopped, this had to happen. This was no accident. This was planned. A plan fulfilled, a task accomplished, responsibility completed. Now think about that. Think about what it says to us. It says that the God chose this. The God chose us, you know? That thousands of years ago, at the dawn of fallen creation, long before we were even born, God set out on this path, this mission, putting all the necessary pieces together for our salvation. God was faithful when we were faithless and sought to completion. He sought till it was finished, right? It is finished proclaims first very simply the foundational fact that God chooses us, that God works on behalf of our salvation, and God is faithful in that work despite our faithlessness and sees it to completion. The first thing that Jesus wants us to know in, in this to help us to live victoriously, that God works for our lives and is faithful. And notice two key things about this. First, that God works for our lives in pieces put together, put in place long before they're needed, right? That is, God is always working far ahead of time. You know, it's like in the psalm that we noted last week was fulfilled, you know, in Jesus' words on, on the cross, a psalm written a thousand years before the fact. So God worked thousands of years ago for us. So God worked on, say, say what you needed today, God was working on 20 years ago. And God is working on what you're going to need 20 years ago from now, right today, you know. Obviously, most often we can't see this, but Jesus wants us to know this is going on, and we can trust in it, you know, that the pieces are there. Just look around. Just look around for them, you know. Author Chris Heim, he offers this illustration. Years ago on a mission trip to the hurricane-ravaged coast of Mississippi, we worked at a home that was owned by the Reverend Mark Jones, a retired United Methodist pastor. He told, of, told us his hurricane story. His daughter had been begging him to drive to Atlanta and to stay with her as the storm approached. There was only one problem. He didn't have any money. He had money in the bank, but it wasn't open. They were penniless. He couldn't get to Atlanta. He had no place to go. When the hurricane came, he and his wife left their home and went to a shelter. After the storm had passed, they were allowed back into the city to grab a few belongings. When they entered the house, the water was still knee-high, but Reverend Jones was determined to see what he could salvage. As he went into his flooded house, he saw several framed family photos floating on the water. He really didn't see anything else to save, so he, he grabbed the pictures and he left. Back at the shelter, he took the photos out of their frame so that they could dry out. When he removed his father's picture, money fell out of the frame. He couldn't believe his find as he counted out $366. Even more astounding was the fact that his father had died in 1942. Reverend Jones was only 12 years old at the time. The money was wrapped in a piece of paper that read emergency fund. Right? It was exactly enough to pay for Reverend Jones and his wife to make their way to Atlanta. Some say it was just a coincidence, just luck, but I say there is no such thing as luck. God had put it there 60 years ago just for that day. Right? Now, obviously, God doesn't always work this dramatically, the dramatic fashion in our lives, but the point still stands that God, first of all, works on our lives far ahead of time, and we can trust in that every day. And then secondly, that God works in our lives in ways we don't expect. This, of course, is the great stumbling block of, of Christ on the cross that people struggle with to this very day. God works salvation in a manner that nobody expected. Only those who can open their minds and their hearts to the surprising ways God works can take hold of this. Are we so hung up on how God is supposed to work in our lives that we miss this, that it goes right by us, like the crowds for whom Jesus' death meant nothing, right? As God is working on our behalf constantly, we've got to be open to the unexpected ways God seeks to come into our lives to save us, you know? Do you remember, you remember this old, old, familiar story? It's a, supposedly, supposedly a true story. One author writes, a woman was at work when she received a phone call that her daughter was very sick with a fever. She left her work and stopped by the pharmacy to get some medication for her daughter. Returning to her car, she found that she had locked her, her, her keys in the car. She was obviously in a hurry to get home to her sick daughter. She didn't know what to do, so she called her home and told the babysitter what had happened and that she did not know what to do. The babysitter told her that her daughter uh, was getting worse. She said, you might find a coat hanger and use that to open the door. The woman looked around and she found an old rusty coat hanger that had been thrown down on the ground, possibly by someone else who at a time, uh, or one time or another, had locked their keys in their car. Then she looked at the hanger and said, I don't know how to use this. 
So she bowed her head and he, she asked God to send her some help. Within five minutes, an old rusty car pulled up with a dirty, greasy, bearded man who was wearing an old biker skull rag on his head. The woman thought, oh my goodness, Lord, this is who you send to help me? But she was desperate. The man got out of his car and he asked her if he could help. And, and she said, yes, my daughter is very sick. I stopped to get her some medication. I locked my keys in the car. I must get home to, 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 to her. Please, can you, can you use this hanger to unlock my car? And he said, sure. And he walked over to the car, and in less than a minute, the car was open. She hugged the man, and through her tears, she said, thank you, you are, you, you are such an incredibly nice man. And, and the man replied, lady, I, I'm, I'm not a nice man. You see, I just got out of prison today. Right? I was in jail for car theft. Right? <laughs> and I've only been out for about an hour. The woman at first was quite taken aback by this, but not quite sure how to respond. But then suddenly a huge smile came over her face, and she hugged the man with a great big hug once again. And with sobbing tears, she looked heavenward. She said, thank you, Jesus, for sending me a professional. Right? <laughs> right? God knows what you need and works in the most mysterious ways to, to get that. You know, God loves to make us laugh, you know, right? In the sixth word from the cross, Jesus first wants us to know that God is always, always faithfully working on our lives, even when we can't see it and in ways we don't expect. The first thing that is finished in Christ's crucifixion that gives us the victory is God's plan for our salvation. The second thing that is finished then is, is sin's hold over us. You know, the word, um, it is finished, um, is actually, it's, it's just one uh, Greek word. That What we say is it is finished, just one Greek word, and it is the word, uh, tetelestai. Uh, it, it's an accounting term. Uh, archaeologists have found ancient receipts with this word written on them, uh, tetelestai. And it means, again, you know, responsibility fulfilled, or, or more technically, in modern language, it, it's translated as paid in full. That is, the debt has been completely paid. It's done. It's finished. And Jesus' second point here is, is, is thus obvious, that in the death his death on the cross, the debt of sin has been paid in full, tetelestai, you know? It's gone. It's finished. It doesn't exist anymore. It is completely paid. Nothing else is required. As it has been said, when it comes to salvation, Jesus didn't make the down payment on the cross and then require us to keep up the payments, right? You know, salvation isn't on the installment plan. Jesus did it all, you know? He, he paid it all, and that means that our redemption, our, our healing with God, which, as we've noted in the past, is that the sole problem of our lives is a finished work. We need only take hold of it, you know? The message being, quit living your life bound by that sin that no longer exists. The sad thing being that we also often resist this. We refuse to believe in it and to live it. We insist, we, 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 insist we continue to live lives ruled by the sin that Jesus has taken completely away. A noted preacher puts it this way. A beggar once stopped a lawyer on the street in a large southern city and asked him for a quarter. Taking a long, hard look into the man's unshaven face, the attorney asked, don't I know you from somewhere? And you should, came the reply. I'm your former classmate. Remember second floor, old main hall? Why, Sam, of course I know you, said the lawyer. And without further question, the lawyer wrote out a check for $20,000. Here, take this and get a new start. I don't care what's happened in the past. It's the future that counts, he said. And, and with that, the, the lawyer hurried on. And tears welled up in, in, in the poor man's eyes as he, he walked to a bank nearby. And stopping at the door, he, he saw through the glass, you know, very well-dressed tellers and spotlessly clean interior. And then he looked at his own filthy rags. And he thought, you know, they, they won't take this from me. They'll, they'll, they'll swear I forged it. Um, he muttered this as he, as he turned away. The next day, the, the two men met again, and seeing the man still in his rags, the lawyer said, Sam, what did you do? What did you do with my check? Did, did you gamble it away? Did you, did you drink it away? No, said the beggar as he pulled the check out of his, his dirty shirt pocket and explained why he hadn't cashed it. Hearing his words, the lawyer said, Listen, friend, what makes that check good is not your clothes or your appearance, but my signature. Go on, cash it. So likewise, the good news is that Jesus has written a check to cover our debt to sin. The payment cost Jesus his life. He bore our sins in his own body on the cross that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. We can be healed of our sinful condition because he paid the price for sin. As we look at our filthy rags, however, we may feel unworthy of cashing the check. 
ashamed of our fruitless attempts to live the way that we should. We don't often feel like we deserve a fresh start. That's, but that's the beauty of grace. We don't deserve it, but because of his love and mercy, God wants us to give us a new beginning. We will never be able to earn this new life. We must simply cash the check. What makes God's check of salvation good is not our clothes or our appearance, but his signature written with the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Don't let the tattered clothes of your past keep you from cashing God's check of salvation today. Cash the check, you know? This is the second thing that Jesus wants wants us to get here, that the debt is paid in full. Our sin is finished. Quit living your life based on who and what sin says you are, on on who, who you were in the past, on what you did or didn't do yesterday. And instead, base it on who and what Jesus' crucifixion says that you are today, right now, always in him. You know, this is what we so often do. We let our sin define our lives. We refuse God's message of the cross and instead endlessly kick ourselves. We hate ourselves. We keep falling back into bad habits, thinking that there's no other way. In pain and frustration, we lash out and, and, and we hurt those around us. Basically, like the beggar in his filthy rags, in, in, in the story, sin keeps us living in our ugliness, you know? Think of it this way. Have you ever noticed that, that when, you feel like, when you feel like you look good, life almost is good, right? How it, 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 it's just somehow better when you're, when you're pleased with your appearance, right? When you've got nice clothes on, everything, everything fits perfectly, you're looking sharp, you know, your hair or, or your skin, whatever, you know, <laughs> is, is, is great, you know? Everything kind of changes, right? You, 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 when you feel like you look good, your whole look, world sort of looks better to you and, you, and you treat it that way, right? You carry yourself a little differently. You're, you're a bit more confident. More things seem possible. You're gracious to people around you. Conversely, have you ever noticed that when you don't feel that you look good, everything else sort of seems lousy, you know, sort of sad and wrong and hopeless and annoying? Well, I would argue that one of the greatest problems in the world today, in, in the world always, is people who feel ugly. Not just physically, but but spiritually ugly. And so they act out in this way against themselves and others. Sin, you see, wants to keep us living in ugliness. Our lives, in effect, become, basically become like some old Rodney Dangerfield, right? You know, Rodney Dangerfield routine. You remember Rodney? You remember Rodney? What did comedian Rodney Dangerfield used to say about himself? He'd say, yeah, no respect, no respect. He'd say, I'm so ugly my mother started having morning sickness after I was born. <laughs> He'd say, I'm so ugly as a kid when I play in the sandbox, the cat kept covering me up. <laughs> He'd say, I'm so ugly, I could never get a date. Once a girl called me up and said, come on over, there's nobody home. I went on over, nobody was home. <laughs> I'm so ugly, he say, I was once feeling sick, and I went to the doctor. I said, Doc, every morning when I get up and look in the mirror, I want to throw up. What's wrong? He said, I don't know, but the good news is that your eyesight is perfect. (laughs) This is the way sin is, only without the laughs. Sin keeps saying to us, you're useless. You're a failure. You're weak. You're ugly, right? Well, Jesus on the cross keeps saying, you're perfect. You're flawless. You're beautiful. Live it. You know, quit living that wrong, that ugliness, and instead live the beauty that Jesus has created in you through his death on the cross. Accept nothing less, you know. I'd like to give us all an assignment this week. Every morning this week when you get up and you look in the mirror, stop and really look at yourself. And no matter what you see, no matter what you see, (laughs) no matter what you see, say to yourself, you are beautiful. Even the guys look in the mirror and say, you are one beautiful man, right? You are one beautiful man. Look at yourself and say, you are beautiful, not because of who you are, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Say this to yourself every morning and then hold on to that thought throughout the day. Try to live it. You know? There's an old saying that says, one cross plus three nails equals four given. That's salvation math, right? It's the most important arithmetic you can ever know. In his sixth word from the cross, Jesus secondly wants us to see ourselves as he has made us, beautiful, forgiven, and loved, and to live only that. Second thing that is finished in Christ's crucifixion is sin's hold. And then finally, the third thing that is finished is the downward spiral of life. 
in the end, of course, to say that something is finished, obviously by its very nature implies that some former situation is now done and a new situation has begun. And this is exactly the final key point that Jesus wants to get at here, that in his death on the cross, an old era is done and a new era has begun. And just what is this new era? Well, it's the new era in which the old covenant, the, the Old Testament, is fulfilled in the one perfect sacrifice of Christ and a new covenant, the New Testament, between God and humanity, experienced through faith in Jesus Christ, has begun. And in this, it's a new era in which evil is now on the run. Some scholars speak of it this way. They, they call Christ's crucifixion the hinge of history. That is, it's the pivot of all creation. That is, in all the time leading up to Jesus, sin and death were on the rise. But in Christ's crucifixion, he defeated sin and death. He fought the decisive battle with evil. And now life is on the rise, begun in his resurrection, to be completed in his, final, in his, his return and final battle with evil. It's the hinge of history. Now, does this mean that sin is done and gone? Of course not. Obviously not. In fact, if anything, sin is going to, be, going, to, going to act out even more now. But you see, that's just desperation. It's the devil trying to keep us from recognizing that he's on the ropes to keep as many people as possible from recognizing that Jesus has the victory and placing their lives in his. Which is exactly what's happening. Essentially, no situation can defeat the person who places their life in Jesus Christ. In the cross, the victory is ours. The thing is, we have to claim this victory. Most Christians nowadays fail to do this. Quite the opposite. They go around all defeated all the time, all cynical and complaining and depressed and fearful, believing that evil is the winner, and thus, in their lives, it is, you know? We've got to turn this around. It has been said, it is tough to be in the dark and not let the dark get in you. The unending struggle for the Christian is to walk in the light and at the same time keep moving through the shadows. Live knowing who wins, and the victory will come to you. In his sixth word from the cross, Jesus seeks to let us know that in his crucifixion, the hinge of history, a brand new era has begun. Sin is on the run, and life is on the rise. The victory is ours. No situation can, confeat, can defeat you if you place your life in Christ. No loss, no pain, no failure, no collapse, no tragedy, no death, nothing. Author Susan Fank writes, at 28, my younger sister's life had ended before it really began. A year ago, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and my world fell apart. The vibrant, feisty, beautiful sister who had been my best friend for a lifetime gradually became a vague shell of herself, replaced with the side effects of her disease and medications. This past year has been like a slow nightmare from which I could not awake. My time eventually became consumed with caring for Angela, endless prayers and hours and hours of tears. Losing my sister broke my heart, but... Watching her suffer shattered my soul. In the months prior to her death, her body began to shut down. What was left of her abilities to function, one by one, becoming lost. She was paralyzed on her right side, and her face and body became tremendously swollen from the, the steroids necessary to control the swelling in her brain. She became weaker and weaker until she could not even turn over in bed. However, the most painful loss for her was her ability to communicate. Her speech, at first affected by only a slight slur that sounded more like an accent, increasingly dropped off into broken sentences, the words unable to make their way to her lips, and then to only an occasional word here or there. Angela was devastated at not being able to form the words that her heart needed to say. Always a talker, as, as all the far girls are, I knew how hard this was for her. I often saw tears trickle down her cheeks with the frustration of not being able to bring the words to the surface. Her loss of speech was also incredibly painful for me. I longed for our giggling sister talks. I miss the hours of babble and laughter, the bond of understanding each other, as only sisters can. I missed our phone calls and the sound of her voice and her contagious, delightful laughter. The last conversation we had was the day before she died. I sat by her bedside, listening to her struggle for breath and knew her time was nearing the end. Suddenly she awoke and she uttered her last word to me. Suze? She groggily said my name, stirring beneath her blankets. I leaned over and took her hand in mine. I'm right here, I said. She squeezed my hand tightly and drifted off again. It was the last time I heard her voice. The next day she left for bluer skies. The morning after she left this life, I awoke with the deepest aching pain I've ever known. I felt as if I, I had been shattered from the inside out. 
I would have given anything for just one more moment, one more hug, one more love you from my sister. I was happy for her that she was with God, now free of pain and full of joy again, but oh, how I ached to see her again, how I longed for the sound of her voice. So I, then I picked up the phone to call mom. Hearing the stutter tone that told me that I had voicemail, I, I dialed in to retrieve my messages. The computer-generated operator's voice telling me that I had to save message for 100 days, I listened for the message, ready to delete whatever I felt unnecessary to save. Nothing seemed important to me anymore. Hi, Suze, it's me, said the voice message. I choked with sobs that immediately came as I heard Angela's voice, full of life once again, her words clear and steady. Her message continued, I know we planned to get together today, but something came up. We'll just have to reschedule. I'll talk to you soon. Love you. I played the message over and over until I memorized her voice and the words, a gift of incredible sunshine on the darkest day of my life. I said a prayer of thanks and knew that this message coming today of all days was not an accident. She had spoken to me, but I had heard God. Death is not the end. We will just have to reschedule. Talk to you soon. Love you. A great scholar once said, in Christ's sixth word from the cross, our Savior seeks to make it clear that what appears to be a tragic ending is actually a glorious beginning. In his death, the start of life for all who believe. It is finished. Believe in the glorious beginning. Finished is God's plan, finished is sin's hold, and finished is the downward spiral. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn, number 368, My Hope is Built. Would you please stand? Oh.